Do you have 20 years of machine learning experience, a PhD in quantum physics, gradient descent? And do you dream of the Linux kernel when you sleep? Um, yes. Not so long ago, I left university with a master degree in computer science. And I had to ask myself the very confusing question, what do I want to be? For me, it was very clear. I wanted to do something with machine learning. And just as with my first dream of becoming a musician, it is terribly hard to find something that you both like and can do. I mean, just using neural networks to compose 8-bit music is not gonna make you any money. And I was not a total beginner. I had some work experience in data science, data engineering, and a computer science degree from a very good university. But this is only a door opener. I mean, you still have to convince them at the interview. And this is exactly what we're gonna talk about today. To make sure that you get your dream job or hire your dream team, and most importantly, only work with people that hit the like button. So if you could just gently destroy the like button, I would be internally grateful. And as a token of my appreciation, here is is a cat holding a like button. Everything that follows is my personal experience that I had during the interview process and I applied to around 12 positions, mostly with a heavy exposure to machine learning and data science. Quite honestly, a lot of them were out of my league, so I did not get every interview. Do you have 20 years of machine learning experience, a PhD in quantum physics, gradient descent, and do you dream of the Linux kernel when you sleep? Um, yes. But I ended up getting around eight interviews, most of which had several stages from coding challenges to also several stages of interviews themselves. Eventually I got three offers and I picked the one that I liked most and I am currently working as a machine learning engineer, the position I have been working towards for a long time with a company that I really like. In principle, there are four different types of questions that you will face. We have programming questions, data science questions, behavioral questions, and of course coding challenges themselves. The bias variance trade-off. I think this is the most common question that I got asked and pretty much every second interview contains some variation of it. It seems like everyone is just googling hey what is a great data science interview question and it pops up at the top of the list. This is probably why everyone is asking it. Anyway, it is definitely very important to understand why it is such a crucial thing in machine learning. To understand the bias variance trade-off we first have to talk about bias and variance. So generally speaking bias is the difference between your expected value and what we're actually estimating. So, so to speak, it's like a constant that you're off of your target, let's say zone of gravity, where your variance is, bit, let's say you're spread around the point where you wanna be. So here effectively visualize, this means when you have a high bias, you see you're quite a bit away from the target. When you have a low variance and a low bias, you're pretty much where you wanna be. When you have a high variance, you're pretty much at the point, you're shooting around the point you want to be, but it's sprinkled all over. And when you have bad, so just high variance, high bias, then you're just completely kind of off the zone. Now, what does this have to do with machine learning? In general, there is a trade-off between bias and variance. So it's also called the bias variance dilemma. And it's to some extent not always minimizable both. I mean, in the case where you're just terrible in both, directions, it's doable, but once you get to a bit more sensible point, there is an actual trade-off between the two. So here it's visualized between on the excess model complexity and here is the error. So when you either when you have, let's say you have a tree model with let's say five nodes and here you have a tree model with a thousand nodes. Here you have a neural network with a dense two dense layers and here you have 20 dense layers. So generally speaking, when you start off and your model cannot capture the actual distribution or the actual data, then your bias will be high. Once you get a bit closer to a certain point, your model, model complexity will be pretty much optimal. So optimal not on the training set, but in the sense of generalization. So how will you perform on your test set? And yes, You can reduce your bias further when you add more nodes, but your variance will suffer on the generalization property. The same thing can happen during training. So um, if you have a neural network, at some point 
you will just have trained enough and your loss function will maybe decrease still a bit, but on your test set you will be worse. Quite important now is that in this zone, this is the so-called overfitting zone. And in this zone you have the so-called underfitting zone. So underfitting means you do not capture your data properly and you can add more complexity or more training time. And overfitting means in that sense that you've trained for too long or you have added too many nodes and it's just basically a, a big data store that captures your training data and has not completely learned what is important, so to speak. This was in short the bias variance dilemma and how it relates to machine learning. The difference between train tests and validation set. I think I got asked about this about in a third of all my interviews and it is indeed quite important. The training set is what you actually train on. The validation set is what you use to determine whether your model can actually learn any further or whether it's already overfitting. And finally the test set is used to estimate the generalization error. So how good will your model be on data that you have not seen? What model would you favor if you were given? Assume you have the results for two models on a data set. The neural network comes in at 94% and your decision tree comes in at 91%. Which model would you favor? Well, there is no right or wrong here. It definitely gives you an opportunity to talk about the trade-off between interpretability and, well, accuracy or whatever metric you're trying to optimize. Well, the decision tree is way easier to understand, a neural network may perform better. But this does not mean that you have to favor one, especially in processes where validating the result is important or explaining to the customer why he's not eligible for a loan. It may be simpler to throw a few percentages of accuracy away and favor the good old explainability. A shit ton of SQL questions. Do you mean SQL? I was so surprised about how many SQL questions I got in pretty much every interview because they have a lot of SQL databases pretty much in any company and if you cannot read from that database you will have a problem. Another good reason for this is of course that in a one-to-one -one meeting it's quite easy to ask about a specific SQL question or query that somebody has to come up with on the spot then about a more complex programming question that would take maybe half an hour to explain you know. Another type of question that you definitely have to be prepared for is behavioral questions. Like, what would you do if a stakeholder tells you these features are the best features for your ML model, but you discover other features are more valuable? In other words, how will you communicate with your stakeholders? How will you communicate to them the results of your work and provide value in collaboration with them? These type of questions seem to be very important for positions such as consulting or in a position or team where you have to interact with a lot of different business areas. My most terrible experience there was in an interview with a big tech giant where it was literally four hours of of behavioral questions and yeah that was very exhausting. Additionally, do you upload data science YouTube videos? How would you approach a problem where you have no labels? Sometimes they ask a question with the purpose of figuring out whether you know an actual concept or several of them. Here it was aimed at figuring out whether you know the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning. Additionally, you could be talking about so many other things such as data labeling with let's say Amazon third and many other concepts. In general, just keep talking and tell them as much as you know. Other approaches may be visualizing the data. Maybe you'll f actually figure out that you can label them in bulk. In general, the answer also depends heavily on in what industry you're interviewing for, because not all answers are suited for the same people. And just generally show them that you care and can be productive as soon as possible. If you had an API, how would you load a CSV? I answered, of course, with pandas because, I mean, they figured that out years ago and it's so easy and everything is implemented already. Wrong. The interviewer then immediately said, you know, that's so wrong and all of you answered this. I took this a bit of a compliment because apparently all data scientists say the same, but in general it apparently takes seven seconds to load and he figured out an easier way where it just takes 300 milliseconds. Yeah, lesson learned. What can you take away from this? Well, don't be too confident in questions where you do not really know the answer because, you know, if you've never actually tested these things, time tested for example, then you just don't know. What is PEP8? We all know it's a meme. PEP8 is the most common 
Python programming guideline. So generally this style, how do you write Python? How many spaces are there after a function declaration? How should you name your variables, etc. This was an example of a programming specific question for a specific language. They may vary depending on what you applied for or what you said you're best in. If you of course put Scala on your resume, maybe they'll ask you something more specifically about that language. What is a confusion matrix? also called error matrix. So I think what I have mentioned so far that sometimes you know if a concept under one name and they may be asking it in the other name. So it may be a good idea to actually learn all the variants of the topic name. If they're from America, they may have a different vocabulary than you're used to. For such a simple question, of course, you cannot tell everything there is to know about confusion matrices. But you can say, for example, in a classification problem, you can compare the true positives, the false negatives with each other, the, and can calculate the recall and the precision and the F1 scores and whatnot from it. Anomaly detection. If you're asked such a broad question or just like some keywords, first thing I would do is talk about the difference between outliers and anomalies. You may have learned that they're the same thing and that's okay, because some people make here a difference and some people don't. For those people that actually make a difference between the two concepts, an outlier is generally something that you can find in your data, so that is from the distribution, but is not very common. And normally, on the contrast, is really something that you would never expect in your data set and just somehow wrongly made it into the data set and would not happen in a real life scenario and you, if your systems would be working correctly. You can talk about various statistical methods, isolation forests, Gaussian mixture models, Keynes neighbors. And if you somehow talk a bit around these topics, you will fill the time very easily. You have to think that in such an interview, you have maybe five or six minutes for a questions at most, and they will back and forth ask questions. And of course, there's also like some social interaction. So they will not grill you like bam, bam, bam. Grid search. Sometimes once you've done your coding challenge, for example, they will ask questions about your code. And in this particular example, I did not implement grid search because uh, I don't know, I had like two and three or three hours time. Grid search is a method to figure out the hyperparameters for your model. Hyperparameters are parameters that are not directly learned by your model, but are effectively specified by you. During, during grid search, for example, let's say you have like one hyperparameter, let's call it n, I don't know, maybe the leaves in some tree, you would now test, for example, for 15 nodes, you would test for 100 nodes, and you would test with a 1000 node and see how the accuracy or whatever benchmark you're comparing against would change in these intervals. More about actual coding challenges that could be happening during such an interview. I made an entire video about implementing um, machine learning API, which is, I think, pretty real life because I got asked something similar in two interviews or in two coding challenges for interviews. And yeah, it's pretty real life. So go check that one out. This was it with me for the week. If you liked it, please like and subscribe such that this video gets recommended to more people. And of course, if you have any other questions, just leave them down in the comments. Of course, if you have also gone through the interview process, leave your questions or the questions that you were asked down in the comments as well, such that we all have a little bit more insight and you know how kind of nervous you are when you're applying for a job. Every little bit helps. So help the community and yeah, we'll see you next week.